All right, so let's get into the seven key elements of a DevSecOps environment. And let's start, uh, let's start with the general way of thinking. All right, so I'm gonna pull up our, um, our diagram we've used for lots of different things, which is our model for DevOps architecture. And this is actually only the top third of it. Um, unless you have a full size monitor, you're not gonna be able to read the text, but this is the full poster. It's meant to be printed in high resolution on a two foot by three foot poster board. Uh, so actually, if anyone would like the full high resolution um, poster file, the PDFs, so that you can get it printed at a print shop, just uh, email me or put it in the chat or, and, and we'd be happy to send it to you. But let me highlight a few things in the top third as we go through here. Um, the, regular, the regular DevOps process always includes a private build on your Git repository. Then you have an integration build that's team-based on some type of build server that's taking the, the code branches from any changes from any developer, integrating them together and making sure that your build script still runs, all your unit tests, your integration tests, whatever levels of testing you have in that. So it's not just a compile, it's much more than that code analysis. And then you're creating packaged up release candidates and you're putting them for .NET, you're putting them in a NuGet server. Azure Artifacts is great for that. Um, it could be as simple as zip files, but you need a name and numbered uh, release candidate. Okay, and then we deploy along a, a DevOps pipeline, and you need at least three environments for that. You have production, you have manual test environment, and then you have an automated test environment. You can have as many of each of those types as you want to. But when you're thinking about security, think of it just like any other feature of software. Security is not just this, hand wavy thing where we say, I don't want a bad thing to happen. That's not, of course we don't want bad things to happen. Of course we don't want a, a data breach. Of course we don't want unauthorized people accessing any part of our system. Duh, we don't want bad things to happen. But that's not, that's not a plan, okay? Um, when, uh, for, for user experience, we might also say, I want the application to be easy to use. That's a goal, okay? So to say I don't want a breach or I want to make my application secure, well, well that's a goal. You know, the absence of a breach, okay, it's been secure so far. Um, but the, the way to think about it is just like any other product management activity. Now you're gonna have the right, the right people making these determinations, educated people who are, who are studying the threats out there, but you want to put the security features in your backlog and you want to write the code for those features. You want to write automated tests for those features. You want to test them in your build. You want to deploy those security features. You want to test those security features, verify those security features, and deploy them to production and monitor those security features. Let me give an example. Um, we don't want unauthorized people to be able to access the application. Well, one of the one of the simple ways that the, the banking industry has um, has combated this is by locking out accounts and making it impossible to not do a, just a constant brute force guess the password attack on a login screen. Whereas, you know, the attackers, one of the, one of the very, very common, banks and credit unions are constantly getting attacked, uh, guessing email addresses, guessing usernames, and then just trying to use dictionary attacks on the password over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, one way to combat it is to add two-factor authentication with a text message or a phone call or security questions. And that's great, but um, uh, an, another way to even back up from that is to not allow some number of incorrect password attempts within a particular time window. And what effectively, what are we doing? We're detecting that we may have an active attack, okay? So the software feature would have some business logic. The software feature would say, would record when we had a bad password attempt. And then when we had another pass, bad password attempt, we'd look at the last time we had a bad one, look at the timing in between, and then, and then choose. Do we want to allow them two quick bad passwords, three, four, five, you know, how many? Because you want to differ from an actual person that lost their password to a, a bot, which is just jamming attempts trying to guess the password, all right? That's a security feature. And 
disable the account, send an alert, things like that. And so systems used by banks and credit unions, that's one of the common solutions. That's one of the common security features that they put in. But any of your attack vectors, you want to think about the risk and, and it's the same product management activities. Design a security feature that has a chance to either minimize the risk of, of a possibility occurring or minimize the impact if the risk actually does occur. All right, so that's the thinking of DevSecOps. So any of the conversation when someone says, oh, we just need it to be secure. Well, that doesn't mean anything. That's a goal. Just like I want the software to be easy to use. That's a goal. But you can't tell the programmers, make it easy to use. All right, you have to actually decide what, what easy to use means, uh, make some hypotheses, uh, banter around a little bit and determine what you're going to do. And then you build it in using the same DevOps process you would, uh, um, you would anyway. Um, this includes firewall rules, network configurations. In Azure, um, you know, that's defined in code, whether it's ARM templates or Terraform. Uh, and so everything, everything can and should be tested. So that's how to think about DevSecOps. Now, um, another thing that you should also assume, and this is, this is really true, you should assume that attacks are always happening. And if you've had a system that has any kind of online surface area at all, then you know that that's true, you, you experienced it. Um, if any of you have just as simple as a public WordPress website, go look at your logs. There is constantly people trying to sniff out if you have a WordPress plugin with a known security vulnerable vulnerability, and they're trying those known um, URL paths to see if they can hack into your website. It's always happening. There's bots scouring the net trying to find known surface area. So just assume that it's always happening because it is. And then um, when it comes to the development team, we've, we've already talked about that and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But every user of your software needs to go through some security, some security training. Um, even, even the basics. We love Know Before as a curriculum for, for training every user. And it starts with basic things like um, knowing how to spot a email that is made to look like it comes from someone in your organization, but is really a phishing email. And it also has cur curriculum, video training, um, and uh, another, uh, another resource is staysafeonline.org. I'd recommend this for everybody as well as your family members. And it's put out by the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And October is coming up. October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And so um, even if it's only your family, uh, you can send them some of the resources. But attacks are always happening.